Section 4 of The Interpretation of Dreams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Interpretation of Dreams by Sigmund Freud. Translated by A. A. Brill. Section 4 internal sensory excitations organic somatic stimuli and psychical sources of stimulation all objections to the contrary notwithstanding we must admit that the role of the objective sensory stimuli as producers of dreams has been indisputably established and if having regard to their nature and their frequency these stimuli seem perhaps insufficient to explain all dream pictures. This indicates that we should look for other dream sources which act in a similar fashion. I do not know where the idea first arose that together with the external sensory stimuli the internal subjective stimuli should also be considered. But as a matter of fact, this has been done more or less explicitly in all the more recent descriptions of the etology of dreams. I believe, says Wundt, that an important part is played in dream illusions by those subjective sensations of sight and hearing which are familiar to us in the waking state, as a luminous chaos in the dark field of the vision, and a ringing buzzing etc of the ears and in especial subjective irritations of the retina this explains the remarkable tendency of dreams to delude the eyes with numbers of similar or identical objects thus we see outspread before our eyes innumerable birds butterflies fishes coloured beads flowers etc here the luminous dust in the dark field of vision has assumed fantastic forms and the many luminous points of which it consists are embodied in our dreams in as many single images which owing to the mobility of the luminous chaos are seen as moving objects this is perhaps the reason of the dream's decided preference for the most varied animal forms for owing to the multiplicity of such forms, they can readily adapt themselves to the subjective luminous images. The subjective sensory stimuli, as a source of dreams, have the obvious advantage that, unlike objective stimuli, they are independent of external accidents. They are, so to speak, at the disposal of the interpretation whenever they are required but they are inferior to the objective sensory stimuli by the fact that their claim to the role of dream inciters which observation and experiment have established in the case of objective stimuli can in their case be verified with difficulty or not at all the main proof of the dream inciting power of subjective sensory stimuli is afforded by the so-called hypnagogic hallucinations which have been described by johann muller as fantastic visual manifestations they are those very vivid and changeable pictures which with many people occur constantly during the period of falling asleep and which may linger for a while even after the eyes have been opened maori who was very subject to these pictures made a thorough study of them and maintained that they were related to or rather identical with dream images this had already been asserted by johann muller maori maintains that a certain psychic passivity is necessary for their origin that it requires a relaxation of the intensity of attention but one may perceive a hypnagogic hallucination in any frame of mind 
if one falls into such lethargy for a moment, after which one may perhaps wake up, until this oft-repeated process terminates in sleep. According to Maori, if one wakes up shortly after such an experience, it is often possible to trace in the dream the images which one has perceived before falling asleep as hypnagogic hallucinations. Thus Maori, on one occasion, saw a series of images of grotesque figures with distorted features and curiously dressed hair, which obtruded themselves upon him with incredible importunity during the period of falling asleep, and which, upon waking, he recalled having seen in his dream. On another occasion, while suffering from hunger, because he was subjecting himself to a rather strict diet, he saw in one of his hypnagogic states a plate, and a hand armed with a fork taking some food from the plate. In his dream he found himself at a table, abundantly supplied with food, and heard the clatter of the diner's forks. On yet another occasion, after falling asleep with strained and painful eyes, he had a hypnagogic hallucination of microscopically small characters, which he was able to decipher, one by one, only with a great effort. And on waking from sleep an hour later, he recalled a dream in which there was an open book with very small letters, which he was obliged to read through with laborious effort. Not only pictures, but auditory hallucinations of words, names, etc., may also occur hypnagogically, and then repeat themselves in the dream, like an overture announcing the principal motif of the opera which is to follow. A more recent observer of hypnagogic hallucinations, G. Trumbull Ladd, follows the same lines as Johann Muller and Maori. By dint of practice, he succeeded in acquiring the faculty of suddenly arousing himself without opening his eyes two to five minutes after gradually falling asleep. This enabled him to compare the disappearing retinal sensations with the dream images remaining in his memory. He assures us that an intimate relation between the two can always be recognised, inasmuch as the luminous dots and lines of light spontaneously perceived by the retina produce so to speak, the outline or scheme of the psychically perceived dream images. For example, a dream in which he saw before him clearly printed lines, which he read and studied, corresponded with a number of luminous spots arranged in parallel lines, or, to express it in his own words, the clearly printed page resolved itself into an object which appeared to his waking perception like part of an actual printed page seen through a small hole in a sheet of paper, but at a distance too great to permit of its being read. Without in any way underestimating the central element of the phenomenon, Ladd believes that hardly any visual dream occurs in our minds that is not based on material furnished by this internal condition of retinal irritability. This is particularly true of dreams which occur shortly after falling asleep in a dark room, while dreams occurring in the morning, near the period of waking, receive their stimulus from the objective light penetrating the eye in a brightly lit room. The shifting and infinitely variable character of the spontaneous luminous excitations of the retina exactly corresponds with the fitful succession of images presented to us in our dreams. If we attach any importance to Ladd's observations, we cannot underrate the productiveness of this subjective source of stimuli, for visual images, as we know, 
are the principal constituents of our dreams the share contributed by the other senses excepting perhaps the sense of hearing is relatively insignificant and inconsistent part three internal organic physical stimuli if we are disposed to look for the sources of dreams not outside but inside the organism we must remember that almost all our internal organs which in a state of health hardly remind us of their existence may in states of excitation as we call them or in disease become a source of the most painful sensations and must therefore be put on a par with the external excitants of pain and sensation strumpel for example gives expression to a long familiar experience when he declares that during sleep the psyche becomes far more deeply and broadly conscious of its corporality than in the waking state and it is compelled to receive and to be influenced by certain stimulating impressions originating in parts of the body and in alterations of the body of which it is unconscious in the waking state even aristotle declares it to be quite possible that a dream may draw our attention to incipient morbid conditions which we have not noticed in the waking state owing to the exaggerated intensity of the impressions experienced in the dream and some medical authors who certainly did not believe in the prophetic nature of dreams have admitted the significance of dreams at least in so far as the predicting of disease is concerned compare m simon and many earlier writers in addition to the diagnostic valuation of dreams for example by hippocrates mention must also be made of their therapeutic significance in antiquity among the greeks there were dream oracles which were vouchsafed to patients in quest of recovery the patient betook himself to the temple of apollo or esculapius there he was subjected to various ceremonies bathed rubbed and perfumed a state of exaltation having been thus induced he was made to lie down in the temple on the skin of a sacrificial ram he fell asleep and dreamed of remedies which he saw in their natural form or in symbolic images which the priests afterwards interpreted even in our days there seems to be no lack of authenticated examples of such diagnostic achievements on the part of dreams thus tissy cites from artiga essay sur la valeur semiologique des rêves the history of a woman of forty-three who during several years of apparently perfect health was troubled with anxiety dreams and in whom a medical examination subsequently revealed an incipient affection of the heart to which she presently succumbed serious derangements of the internal organs clearly excite dreams in quite a number of persons the frequency of anxiety dreams in diseases of the heart and lungs has been generally realized indeed this function of the dream life is emphasized by so many writers that i shall here content myself with a reference to the literature of the subject radistock spitter maori m simon tissy tissy even believes that the diseased organs impress upon the dream content its characteristic features the dreams of persons suffering from diseases of the heart are generally very brief and end in a terrified awakening death under terrible circumstances almost always find a place in their content those suffering from diseases of the lungs dream of suffocation of being crushed and of flight and a great many of them are subject to the familiar nightmare which by the way borner has succeeded in inducing experimentally 
by lying on the face and covering the mouth and nostrils. In digestive disturbances, the dream contains ideas from the sphere of gustatory enjoyment and disgust. Finally, the influence of sexual excitement on the dream content is obvious enough in everyone's experience and provides the strongest confirmation of the whole theory of dream instigation by organic sensation. Moreover, if we study the literature of dreams, it becomes quite evident that some writers, such as Maori or Vagant, have been led to the study of dream problems by the influence their own pathological state has had on the content of their dreams. The enlargement of the number of dream sources by such undeniably established facts is, however, not so important as one might be led to suppose. For dreams are, after all, phenomena which occur in healthy persons, perhaps in all persons, and every night, and a pathological state of the organs is evidently not one of the indispensable conditions. For us, however, the question is not whence particular dreams originate, but rather, what is the exciting cause of ordinary dreams in normal people? But we have only to go a step farther to find a source of dreams which is more prolific than any of those mentioned above, and which promises indeed to be inexhaustible. If it is established that the bodily organs become, in sickness, an exciting source of dreams, and if we admit that the mind, when diverted during sleep from the outer world, can devote more of its attention to the interior of the body, we may readily assume that the organs need not necessarily become diseased in order to permit stimuli, which in one way or another grow into dream images, to reach the sleeping mind. What in the waking state we vaguely perceive as a general sensation, perceptible by its quality alone, a sensation to which, in the opinion of physicians, all the organic systems contribute their share, this general sensation would at night attain a greater potency, and, acting through its individual components, would constitute the most prolific as well as the most usual source of dream representations. We should then have to discover the laws by which organic stimuli are translated into dream representations. This theory of the origin of dreams is the one most favoured by all medical writers. The obscurity which conceals the essence of our being, the moi splanknik, as Tissy terms it, from our knowledge, and the obscurity of the origin of dreams, correspond so closely that it was inevitable that they should be brought into relation with one another. The theory according to which the organic sensations are responsible for dreams has, moreover, another attraction for the physician, inasmuch as it favours the etiological union of the dream with mental derangement, both of which reveal so many points of agreement in their manifestations, since changes in the general organic massive sensation and in the stimuli emanating from the internal organs are also considered to have a far-reaching significance as regards the origin of the psychoses. It is therefore not surprising that the organic stimulus theory can be traced to several writers who have propounded this theory independently. A number of writers have followed the train of thought developed by Schopenhauer in 1851. Our conception of the universe has its origin in the recasting by the intellect of the impressions which reach it from without in the moulds of time, space and causality. 
during the day the stimuli proceeding from the interior of the organism from the sympathetic nervous system exert at most an unconscious influence on our mood at night however when the overwhelming effect of the impressions of the day is no longer operative the impressions that surge upward from within are able to force themselves on our attention just as in the night we hear the rippling of the brook that was drowned in the clamour of the day but how else can the intellect react to these stimuli than by transforming them in accordance with its own function into things which occupy space and time and follow the lines of causality and so a dream originates thus skirner and after him volkett endeavoured to discover the more intimate relations between physical sensations and dream pictures but we shall reserve the discussion of this point for our chapter on the theory of dreams as a result of a singularly logical analysis the psychiatrist krauss referred the origin of dreams and also of deliria and delusions to the same element namely to organically determined sensations according to him there is hardly any part of the organism which might not become the starting point of a dream or a delusion organically determined sensations he says may be divided into two classes one general sensations those affecting the whole system two specific sensations those that are immanent in the principal systems of the vegetative organism and which may in turn be subdivided into five groups a the muscular b the pneumatic c the gastric d the sexual e the peripheral sensations the origin of the dream image from physical sensations is conceived by krauss as follows the awakened sensation in accordance with some law of association evokes an idea or image bearing some relation to it and combines with this idea or image forming an organic structure towards which however the consciousness does not maintain its normal attitude for it does not bestow any attention on the sensation but concerns itself entirely with the accompanying ideas and this explains why the facts of the case have been so long misunderstood krauss even gives this process the special name of transubstantiation of the sensations into dream images the influence of organic physical stimuli on the formation of dreams is today almost universally admitted but the question as to the nature of the law underlying this relation is answered in various ways and often obscurely on the basis of the theory of physical excitation the special task of dream interpretation is to trace back the content of a dream to the causative organic stimulus and if we do not accept the rules of interpretation advanced by skirner we shall often find ourselves confronted by the awkward fact that the organic source of excitation reveals itself only in the content of the dream a certain agreement however appears in the interpretation of the various forms of dreams which have been designated as typical because they recur in so many persons with almost the same content among these are the well-known dreams of falling from a height of the dropping out of teeth of flying and of embarrassment because one is naked or scantily clad this last type of dream is said to be caused simply by the dreamer's perception felt in his sleep that he is thrown off the bedclothes and is uncovered the dream that one's teeth are dropping out is explained by dental irritation which does not however 
of necessity imply a morbid condition of irritability of the teeth according to strumpel the flying dream is the adequate image employed by the mind to interpret the quantum of stimulus emanating from the rising and sinking of the pulmonary lobes when the cutaneous sensation of the thorax has lapsed into insensibility this latter condition causes the sensation which gives rise to images of hovering in the air the dream of falling from a height is said to be due to the fact that an arm falls away from the body or a flexed knee is suddenly extended after unconsciousness of the sensation of cutaneous pressure has supervened whereupon this sensation returns to consciousness and the transition from unconsciousness to consciousness embodies itself psychically as a dream of falling the weakness of these fairly plausible attempts at explanation clearly lies in the fact that without any further elucidation they allow this or that group of organic sensations to disappear from psychic perception or to obtrude themselves upon it until the constellation favourable for the explanation has been established later on however i shall have occasion to return to the subject of typical dreams and their origin from a comparison of a series of similar dreams m simon endeavoured to formulate certain rules governing the influence of organic sensations on the nature of the resulting dream he says if during sleep any organic apparatus which normally participates in the expression of an effect for any reason enters into the state of excitation to which it is usually aroused by the effect the dream thus produced will contain representations which harmonize with that effect another rule reads as follows if during sleep an organic apparatus is in a state of activity stimulation or disturbance the dream will present ideas which correspond with the nature of the organic function performed by that apparatus morley vault has undertaken to prove the supposed influence of bodily sensation on the production of dreams by experimenting on a single physiological territory he changed the positions of a sleeper's limbs and compared the resulting dreams with these changes he recorded the following results one the position of a limb in a dream corresponds approximately to that of reality that is we dream of a static condition of the limb which corresponds with the actual condition two when one dreams of a moving limb it always happens that one of the positions occurring in the execution of this movement corresponds with the actual position three the position of one's own limb may in the dream be attributed to another person four one may also dream that the movement in question is impeded five the limb in any particular position may appear in the dream as an animal or monster in which case a certain analogy between the two is established six the behaviour of a limb may in the dream incite ideas which bear some relation or other to this limb thus for example if we are using our fingers we dream of numerals results such as these would lead me to conclude that even the theory of organic stimulation cannot entirely abolish the apparent freedom of the determination of the dream picture which will be evoked part four psychic sources of excitation when considering the relation of dreams to waking life and the provenance of the material of dreams 
we learned that the earliest as well as the most recent investigators are agreed that men dream of what they do during the day and of the things that interest them in the waking state this interest continued from waking life into sleep is not only a psychic bond joining the dream to life but it is also a source of dreams whose importance must not be underestimated and which taken together with those stimuli which become active and of interest during sleep suffices to explain the origin of all dream images yet we have also heard the very contrary of this asserted namely that dreams bear the sleeper away from the interests of the day and that in most cases we do not dream of things which have occupied our attention during the day until after they have lost for our waking life the stimulating force of belonging to the present hence in the analysis of dream life we are reminded at every step that it is inadmissible to frame general rules without making provision for qualifications by introducing such terms as frequently as a rule in most cases and without being prepared to admit the validity of exceptions if interest during the waking state together with the internal and external stimuli that occur during sleep suffice to cover the whole etiology of dreams we should be in a position to give a satisfactory account of the origin of all the elements of a dream the problem of the dream sources would then be solved leaving us only the task of discriminating between the part played by the psychic and that played by the somatic dream stimuli in individual dreams but as a matter of fact no such complete solution of a dream has ever been achieved in any case and everyone who has attempted such a solution has found that components of the dream and usually a great many of them are left whose source he is unable to trace the interests of the day as a psychic source of dreams are obviously not so influential as to justify the confident assertion that every dreamer continues the activities of his waking life in his dreams other dream sources of a psychic nature are not known hence with the exception perhaps of the explanation of dreams given by skirner to which reference will be made later on all the explanations found in the literature of the subject show a considerable hiatus whenever there is a question of tracing the images and ideas which are the most characteristic material of dreams in this dilemma the majority of authors have developed a tendency to belittle as far as possible the share of the psychic factor which is so difficult to determine in the evocation of dreams to be sure they distinguish as major divisions the nerve stimulus dream and the association dream and assert that the latter has its source exclusively in reproduction but they cannot dismiss the doubt as to whether they appear without any impulsion from organic stimuli and even the characteristic quality of the pure association dream disappears to quote volquet in the association dream proper there is no longer any question of such a stable nucleus here the loose grouping penetrates even to the very centre of the dream the imaginative life already released from the control of reason and intellect is here no longer held together by the more important psychical and physical stimuli but is left to its own uncontrolled and confused divagations Vunt too attempts to belittle the psychic factor in the evocation of dreams 
by asserting that the phantasms of the dream are perhaps unjustly regarded as pure hallucinations probably most dream representations are really illusions inasmuch as they emanate from the slight sensory impressions which are never extinguished during sleep vagant has adopted this view and generalizes upon it he asserts that the most immediate causes of all dream representations are sensory stimuli to which reproductive associations then attach themselves tissy goes still further in suppressing the psychic sources of excitation le rêves d'origine absolument psychique ne existent pas and elsewhere les pensées de nos rêves ne viennent de dehors those writers who like the eminent philosopher wundt adopt a middle course do not hesitate to assert that in most dreams there is a cooperation of the somatic stimuli and the psychic stimuli which are either unknown or are identified with the interests of the day we shall learn later that the problem of dream formation may be solved by the disclosure of an entirely unsuspected psychic source of excitation in the meanwhile we shall not be surprised at the overestimation of the influence of those stimuli which do not originate in the psychic life it is not merely because they alone may easily be found and even confirmed by experiment but because the somatic conception of the origin of dreams entirely corresponds with the mode of thought prevalent in modern psychiatry here it is true the mastery of the brain over the organism is most emphatically stressed but everything that might show that the psychic life is independent of demonstrable organic changes or spontaneous in its manifestations is alarming to the contemporary psychiatrist as though such an admission must mean a return to the old world natural philosophy and the metaphysical conception of the nature of the soul the distrust of the psychiatrist has placed the psyche under tutelage so to speak it requires that none of the impulses of the psyche shall reveal an autonomous power yet this attitude merely betrays a lack of confidence in the stability of the causal concatenation between the physical and the psychic even where on investigation the psychic may be recognized as the primary cause of a phenomenon a more profound comprehension of the subject will one day succeed in following up the path that leads to the organic basis of the psychic but where the psychic must in the present state of our knowledge be accepted as the terminus it need not on that account be disavowed end of section four recording by steve chilvers norwich england